to. That's my Bill Lewis impression. <laughs> Welcome to Stone Soup. I'm going to be Bill Lewis in light of Bill Lewis. I feel bad for, uh, I apologize to Nancy Dotson because I cannot, I cannot reach her. And Carol might be trying to reach me now. My phone receives calls, but I can't take them, answer them, or even unlock my phone because my phone is a, uh, I think the phrase is a fucking hot mess. <laughs> so uh, hopefully tomorrow it'll be okay and Stone Soup can resume. That's what I'm hoping for. I mean, I hope Stone Soup can resume as normal with our regular phone callers. Apologies in advance to the phone callers, although Carol said she wasn't going to be here. Maybe she changed her mind. Um, and hopefully we'll get more announcements as far as Stone Soup features for the rest of the year as uh, my life uh, promises to be slightly 10% less complicated uh, within a 60-day period. Um, let's get to the people who are uh, very faithful to get on the open mic. I've been announcing these very last minute for good reasons because I don't know from week to week if my services are going to be needed elsewhere. I will be turning away. So if you see my um, if you see my screen go blank, it's not because I'm trying to ignore you. It's because I am uh, dealing with my girlfriend's dinner. So who is uh, currently unable to stand in front of a stove for more than like 30 seconds. So we are Believe me, I timed it. I, I, I trained her, but no, she's not there yet. So we are going to get this party started quickly and right. Those of you joining us, I put in a link in the comments section if you want to join the open mic. So, oh, and John is featuring at 4 p.m. on uh, August 27th. Uh, gave us the Zoom code. I'm sure you'll put more information on the, uh, on the Stone Soup uh, Facebook page which everyone who's listening to this one day afterwards is uh, welcome to join in a time uh, for more Stone Soup news and other poetry related issues at uh, times. I'm trying to petition to get Ibbotson Street, the local poetry journal to actually have a theme on punching Nazis. I don't know if they'll do it, but I do have an artist who would draw Doug Holder punching Hitler in the face to, to, Im to imitate the Captain America comic from 1940, uh, was it 1941? And I, I forget, but... Um, but yeah, so we are in the we are on the way getting started. The Ramnadator Five Thousand has chosen our returning open micer, Miss Mary Jennings. Thank you. Um, I I completed writing this on um, on the day of. Roe versus Wade being overturned, and it took me about a month to add the final verse to it. Um, and this is one of the love child ballads called The Ballad of Everything Happens for a Reason. Things of the past, saints in rags, see right through them like ghosts in the night. Heaven sent virgins unspoiled by age or rage. What lucky man will vie for her pot of, of honey, pop open her vagina for a seventh son of a seventh son and conveniently, and conveniently forget about her when he displays his family pride. She's got a roof over her head. She will have a bright future as a meddlesome nag nobody wants to listen to, possessing knowledge of trivia that serves no one well. Let's revive the beauty pageant for a glorious sight of her thigh. If she can sing and cook as good as she looks, then she has it made. Get the drift? Spot on. We are all stained, married or not experienced or not. Say hay. Hay is for horses. A horse is a nag. A nag is what a woman is called who bears the weight of the world on her back and won't shut up about it. Let her reclaim nag for the hours she put in for scant pay. Let her wear her stain like Hester Prynne did and go about her business, making some poor fool suffer. 
everything happens for a reason, you say. Rape, pillage, genocide. Got to hold on to what is yours. As if women didn't have something of her own to hold on to that is eternal as well as external. Something necessary for the survival of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Ramden Air 5000 is chosen next. The part of Bill Lewis will have to be played by Chris Fitzgerald this week, so it seems. Uh, I'll be looking out for Bill and for CC, but um, I think you're up for the task, Chris. Thank you so much, and uh, the floor is yours. This is called Mark Twain, a classic, something everyone praises, no one reads. This is the movie version. Were we on vacation or was it work? I sometimes have a problem recalling recall how my society values the moment. It was in the state with the green mountains anyways, 7.30 in the morning. The children would come into our bedroom to get us up as they were fully rested. We of course didn't get to sleep two, maybe three. We weren't as perky. I don't remember how we did discover, but love does open so many doors. Thanks to modern technology, the VCR in the living room after a few days, when the kids came in, I would get up and go downstairs to the living room and because of my mechanical know-how, slip in a tape. The children would be entertained for two hours of what passes as Hollywood magic. I would then return from some toe-to-toe -to -toe magic. We would then express verbally and non-verbally alike the pleasures intimate company can bring. I wouldn't say we started the day on the right foot. No, it was your left foot and its partner the right pointing up towards the ceiling. That was how we greeted the day. Well begun as half done as little Aristotle used to run around saying, movie over, children's return, you would get up, breakfast and other duties. I still wouldn't get up to 11. No one seemed to like the way I scrambled eggs. Those hours, 7.30 to 9.30, they were not stolen from the children or the world. That time made us both happier and healthier human beings, benefiting the children and the cosmos at large. Since that time, when anyone outside has brought up in polite conversation, the movies, Annie, the Gremlins, the Goonies, the never ending story, though I've never seen any of them, I immediately respond, whoa, that's a classic. And then I'll read two pages of another one. Okay. Uh, this is snap, snap here, snap, snap there. My ass. God lives in the ever-present moment. Prose writers seem to live inside of yesterday's stories. That's why I consider them bag man for the camera people. Snap, snap here, snap, snap there, snap, snap here, snap, snap there. The future should always smell of fresh air. That's the territory the poet explores. Yesterday, let it go, let it go, let it go. Three old world lines that try to condemn the new world to the old world's quicksand. The three lines are from the Arden work in memory of William Butler Yeats. Mad Island drove you into poetry. Mad, patronizing, condescending, funkle junkle. An Englishman calling an Irishman mad. That's like Danny Diarrhea telling Frankie Fartpants you have a hygiene problem. Frankie isn't so thin skinned that he can't handle criticism. If Penelope Perfume mentions him that he ought to clean up his act a little, Frankie responds, I'm spending the weekend in the bar tub. Don't worry. I'll keep changing the water in the bathtub. Uh, I'll keep changing the water. And P, I want you to smell me on Monday. I'll be there for you, Frankie. I'll be there. But when Danny Diarrhea says it to him, he utilizes words that you or I would use. Are you shitting me? Plus, I think you just shit yourself again. The second line, poetry makes nothing happen. That's a shabby, dishonest line. Poetry is not a religion. Poetry is not a political theory. Poetry is not a philosophy. It doesn't speak in declarative sentences, trying to assemble, assemble a group of believers. Poetry helps you discover the wit, spine, and charm of your language. Tanks make something happen. They lob shells, which kill a maim. Sexual intercourse can make something happen. It can create a new human being or have two people say, you're not that bad after all. Jobs can make something happen. 
two people cash their checks, now have money because of the time they gave their jobs. They plan to meet on a Saturday afternoon for a drink or an ice cream if both are on the wagon. Poetry finds a much greater expansion of the language with joy than bombs and bullets. In fact, three weeks after Johann Gutenberg had the print press up and moving in 1452 in Mainz, Germany, it was a poet. Can't remember his whole name, but everyone called him Willie. On the back of his T-shirt, it said, Bullies Whacketh. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And now we'll bring up uh, our legacy poet, Julian Powers. I'm gonna read a short poem by Jack uh, titled, Satisfaction. I have a thousand nickels. Trump has a billion dollars. The Dalai Lama, a trillion prayers. And out in the backyard, totally content, my dog with one bone. Thank you. Where'd you find that one? I found it on Oddball. Uh oh, I should have remembered that one because <laughs> I'm the one who published it. Whoops. <laughs> Hey, whoopsie! I, I I did think it was I did find it I find it familiar. To be fair, very nice. And now we will uh, move on to the man we call Magister Gult. I don't know why I call use the German accent for that. Probably because John told me I'm gonna have to sing Heil the Fior the Fiero's face the uh, famous the song made famous by the cartoon where Donald Duck dreamed he was a Nazi. <laughs> it's um, maybe should be pronounced in the Latin accent, but we don't know what that is anymore. You know, being a dead language and all that. <laughs> uh, maybe the zombies can teach us how to pronounce it, you know. It might be one of the upsides of there being a zombie apocalypse as well, learning some of these dead languages again. Anyway, uh, this one is called Aunt Kristen. But I read it here before. It's been a darn long time. Okay. So, Aunt Kristen. Um, here we go. According to the family lore, Aunt Kristen, six years my senior, announced at the Thanksgiving table that she hated, ra that she didn't like raisins. I immediately stated that I, too, hated raisins. I immediately stated that I, too, hated raisins. Now, Aunt Kristen did like raisins. She simply wasn't in the mood for them at that time. Um, I had liked raisins quite a bit. But being the impressionable young lad I then was, her statement and my reiteration of it must have taken hold in my mind, even at that, even at the neurological level. Um, so, um, yes. Um, all these years later, as the bills come each month and pile up the way they do, far outstripping my ability to pay any of them. I wonder why Aunt Kristen could not simply have announced at the Thanksgiving table that she was going to be a millionaire by the age of 20. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And now, and now we'll go to uh, Mr. John Wesick. Hi, Chad. May I share the screen, please? Yeah, let me just uh, make sure you're able to. Pause the No, that's not it.
I just gotta remember what the, my screen's changed a little bit, so I just have to remember. Uh, I remember that little, the little oh, here we go. shield thing, okay. Are we good? Here we, I think we're good. Okay, let me try it. Well, look at that, we're good. Okay, well, uh, you know, ladies and gentlemen, um, when the FBI uh, searched <laughs> Donald Trump's uh, Mar-a-Lago estate back on uh, August 8th, uh, they forgot, they missed one. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, scribbled on a napkin uh, hidden under their cadenza, and it has uh, uh, fallen into my uh, my hands. It's uh, for parity use only. You see the header and the footer. Federal security regulations as amended by Donald Trump. Introduction. These are the best security regulations, a beautiful set of security regulations, even better than all the security regulations that came before. If George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, and Jesus Christ created security regulations, they wouldn't hold a candle to these. From now on, these security regulations replace those promulgated by FDR, Antifa, and radical left-wing Democrats. Signed, uh, Donald J. Trump, uh, August 8th, oh, excuse me, uh, 20th of January, uh, 2021. Security clearances. A security clearance is an honor bestowed by the federal government indicating that you're someone in the know, an insider possessing information that makes you smarter than the other guy. Holders of security clearances shall use every opportunity to remind those who don't of this fact. And if you know about, you know, regulations, I mean, shall means it's something that you absolutely have to do. Uh, classification levels. Documents are classified according to three levels. Confidential. Documents that can be traded for a free meal or drink. The kind of lightweight stuff you'll find on Hillary's server. Secret. Documents that can be obtained by foreign nationals who rent rooms in the Trump International Hotel. Top secret. Documents that can get the Trump organization out of bankruptcy. In addition, some documents may be labeled sensitive compartmented information or SCI. Revelation of these documents shall be reserved to impress only the most special foreign leaders, such as Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, and Kim Jong-un, but not losers like Macron. Storage of classified information, if not left unattended on one's desk, classified documents shall be stored beneath a mattress or under a pile of dirty laundry. If not feasible, they may be photographed and posted on Twitter. As of 8th of January 2021, classified documents shall be posted on Truth Social instead. Transmission of classified material. Classified material may only be transmitted to those who, one, will express admiration for the transmitter's access, and two, repay the transmitter at a rate commensurate with the document's classification level. Destruction of classified material. When no longer needed, classified documents shall be turned over to Nikolai, who will spirit them out of the country far from the hands of Merrick Garland, Nancy Pelosi, and radical left-wing Democrats. Nuclear codes. From this point forward, the nuclear launch codes shall be changed to password, as all those letters, symbols, and numbers are too much of a bother to remember. For parity use only. Thank you, everybody. And that, that, that thing appeared on this uh, website. What's it called? Uh, some magazine. Some <laughs> ball. Not an even ball. I don't know. One of those. Thanks. Thank you, John. Check out oddballmagazine.com. And uh, if you get a chance, congratulate Jason for the birth of his daughter. He wrote his first poem. Uh, and our, of our existence and actually posted a photo that we could no longer use because I guess he I guess it was professionally taken he doesn't have the copyright but it's so cute it was actually his uh his daughter just like sleeping right next to a little red three ball which is pretty amazing it, it was it was actually really really adorable I was very happy but uh I guess he he's uh has to dicker over the copyright before anyone can seize it 
can see it yet. Oh, here we go. Let's, uh, ah, good. So next is the post of Pulse of Stone Soup, ready to give us his beat, carry us through the rest of the round robin. Let's give it up for Mr. Ethan Mack. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Okay. That's a wrap, people. At least for the first round of the round robin. Thank you so much, Ethan. Right. No, no. And now we take you to uh, the closer of the round one of the round robin. Let us and check out his column next this uh, coming Thursday, which is to say tomorrow for Oddball Magazine. It's all one thing at 11 o'clock in the morning. Let's welcome up Mr. James Van Loy. Hi, everybody. So, uh, oh my, Jan is just coming in the door. I better go help her, just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. <clears throat> Just, I'm just getting ready to read, honey. I'm reading right now. So I have a poem here. It's called Another Morning. My right big toe wakes me with its pain. And as the ache persists, so does the strain of the war on the AM TV screen. This not so cold war makes my old cold war brain keen. I've seen this movie too many times before. 
And even after I finally find the medicine for my gout, that old global inflammatory disease of burning nuclear holocaust, can't Munich appease the madness of what too much power does to men because I'm back in 1962, planes in the air again. So that was the poem I wrote uh, at the uh, advent of the invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. And uh, here's a song for you by Buffy St. Marie. He's five foot two and he's six foot four. He fights with missiles and with spears. He's all of 31 and he's only 17. He's been a soldier for a thousand years. He's a Catholic, a Hindu, an atheist and a giant, a Buddhist and a Baptist and a Jew. And he knows he shouldn't kill and he knows he always will kill you for me, my friend, and me for you. And he's fighting for Canada, he's fighting for France, he's fighting for the USA. And he's fighting for the Russians and he's fighting for Japan, and he thinks he'll end war this way. <laughs> and he's fighting for democracy, he's fighting for the Reds, he says it's for peace of all. He's the one who must decide who's to live and who's to die. And he never sees the writing on the walls. But without him, how would Hitler have condemned them at Dachau? Without him, Caesar would have stood alone. He's the one who gives his body as a weapon to the war. Without him, all this killing can't go on. He's the universal soldier and he really is to blame. His orders come from far away no more. They come from him and you and me and brothers and sisters, can't you see? This is not the way we put an end to war. Thank you. Thank you, James. All right. Looks like it's a quieter night than I thought, even with the broken phone taking out two of our people. Um, is Jan going to read the? I'll, I'll never mind. She can she can read if she wants to at the end. It's okay, but um, I won't bug her right now. She just got in for Christ's sake. Okay, let's. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the bathroom, you bastard. Okay, let's. Um, Go now, start off with uh, Miss Mary Jennings. Thank you. Um, here's another love child ballad called The Ballad of the Humor Impaired Woman. She is a pear shaped woman, ripe for the picking and dumping of mud upon by the two bit comic seeking amusement from his humdrum existence. Hey, Miss Snip, why are you so serious? Don't I get a laugh from you? He's read, take a long walk off a short pier right. But he still wants to ride her pride off into the sunset just because her hormones took a dip. Her womb bore no kids. She lives the values she's been taught. Work hard and reap many rewards. Treat others as you want to be treated. But no matter how hard she works and how much she gives, all she gets is a punchline to the story of her life. She's wasted her graces on one who gets his wit from the sewer, which he casts her integrity in, initially pretending to be in awe of her, thus taking her for a fool. For her, it's about the struggle if she wanted to find humor in it, she would know where to look. Not from the two-bit comic who uses humor to try to shame her for her life choices. 
she made that choice because the only child she raised was herself. Early on, aware early on of denigration calling itself love. She's better off alone than to be mismatched with one who wants to grind her to a pulp, like the two-bit comic who couldn't get his wife to laugh at his jokes. Therefore, he tries them out on somebody new with similar results. Like the wife, she doesn't live with him and won't keep his house for him. She's no fool there. No man needed to make her honest. She made herself honest, which is what he can't handle. Thus, the division he calls humor. The pear-shaped woman bears fruit in other ways and insists you don't let it go to rot. It can nourish you or it can poison you, depending on your constitution. The pear-shaped woman uh, the pear-shaped woman's sense of humor is alive and well, both juicy and dry, tart and sweet, whatever the situation requires. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And Chris Fitzgerald, looks like you're up for another turn. Just gone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, the first one, uh, I'm gonna miss a couple of words because it's from memory. And it's basically my religious philosophy, my political philosophy and my philosophy philosophy. And it's a E. e. Cummings poem called, If I. If I or anybody doesn't know where her, his, it's, my next meal's coming from, I say, that doesn't matter. And if he, she, it, or everybody gets a bully belly full without lifting a finger, I say, the hell with that. It doesn't matter. But if somebody or you are deep or beautiful or generous, what I say is sing that, shout that, yell that out loud, louder than cosmic rays, war, famine, or the ex-prince of whoosies diving into a whatsies to rescue Miss Nobody's handbag. So that's not swell, babe. Get me, not understand me. Lousy kid, that's something else, my sweet. I feel that's true. And this is the second half, uh, couple pages of a April poem I did. Uh, my second New York City smart ass is also from Manhattan. Quite possibly the most famous movie star of all time, Humphrey DeForest Bogart. Very well-to-do family, Dutch, New Amsterdam. His father was a renowned heart surgeon. New Yorkers from the get-go. Indeed, five, six weeks before Peter Minuet bought the Isle of Manhattan from the natives for $24 worth of beads, Bogey had a direct ancestor off of the same natives for the same property, $17 worth of beads. Take a friggin' flying hike, the natives told him, and the family ended up having the cheap stink on them for the next 180, 190 years, until finally one of the family members sponsored a couple of inner city kids to go up to the Catskills for the summer. Shit, it was hot that summer. Shit, it was hot. No one ever brought a more New Yorkers delight to the language than Bogey, baby. Remember when Claude, Ray, Claude Rain said to him, why'd you come to Casablanca, Rick? Why'd you come? I came for my health, the waters. But Rick, <coughs> we're in the middle of the desert, no water here. Rick, I was misinformed. Beautiful New York sass. When I was 18, 19, saying to myself, if I don't say the next line at least twice, I won't be able to look at my life as a success. The line was when Ingrid Bergman points the gun in Rick's face. I want the letter to transit or I will shoot you. Rick says, go ahead, shoot me. You'll be doing me a favor. I regret I was never given the opportunity. And when Major Strass are bragging about how well the war's going for Germany, we got Paris, London next, and then what, Washington, New York? Rick says to the bully and Berlinian bastard, there's certain neighborhoods in New York. If I was you Germans, I wouldn't be so quick to enter. In your face, scumbag, pure gold. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. 
As always, and now we're re as predetermined by the Remnator 5000 from the previous round, Robin. And I suppose she's the source of the dog alert that John just uh, posted. Oh, I wanted to see a little girl. Anyway, let's um, let's bring up as Julian Powers. Um, this one is called uh, Loose Strife Fields. August is a time on the edge of waning. Yellows, silvers, oranges, blue, dayflowers blooming every single morning now, greens fading to brown. The paling flagged by fields of purple loose strife and homes with their opening morning glories. But soon it'll be all the reds every shade of red there is, like the striking cardinal lobelia by the riverbeds. Life falling on fire until nature and wildlife are asleep or dead once again. Thank you. Thank you, Julianne. And now up next, Magister Galt in the, which I would pronounce, except all Latin people are dead. So we don't know what it is. Actually, Eddie Izzard had a great routine about that. He's like, all Romans are dead. You don't know what they sounded like in Latin. They could have just been walking around going, hello, we're the Romans. You know, like it's, hey, we're the Romans. We're coming to get you. Uh, um, up next, Magister, Magister Galt. <laughs> Looks like you got to put on the, yep, there you go. Thank you very much. This one is somewhat, I guess, inspired by Dostoevsky's Notes from the Underground. And I call my version Confessions of a Stairway Man, Stairwell Man. Um, one reason you don't remember me is because generally speaking, I'm not the kind of guy that people generally recall or even see in the first place. People tell me sometimes that they thought I was a statue, which is perfectly understandable since I stand very quietly to allow them to look at paintings and other exhibits. Of course, I am there to answer questions, but most prefer to stand and read the panels as they progress along the rail. When they are ready to ascend the steps, I tell them that it is a one-way stairwell and that they will be going down another way, back into the courtyard, which is where they started from. If they wish to see the first floor a second time, then they were welcome to re-enter through the way. They were welcome to enter through the way in which they first came. It is only because the stairwell is so narrow that it is necessary. If we were to allow people to go down as well as up, the passage would be terribly congested. So for safety and convenience, we have people go down, then around the way they came. It would, of course, be easier if the staff person upstairs would simply tell people to not go back down the stairwell, but this isn't always possible. And people would sometimes resent being told that they couldn't go back down once they were already up. Also, it's easier for the staff upstairs to get people to cooperate if they were told about the stairwell before. Once already upstairs, people agree quickly because they don't want to be told again. In fact, they didn't want to be told the first time. And I do say it a lot to everyone who goes up. Then there are the usual things that have to be brought up. Photography, 
eating, drinking, and more recently, the cell phone. You would think this would not need to be mentioned, but people seem to have a need to always be on the phone in restaurants, in church, in traffic, crossing the street while the traffic is still going, while sitting on the john. So they wouldn't think twice about it in a museum. When I bring it up, they always look at me like I've committed a cardinal act of blasphemy. Or perhaps I am some pagan persecutor of, that, of their religion. They believe that I am dead from the neck up. The only thing really saving me from that is being a poet. When nobody is in the room in which I am stationed, I stand leaning on the rail or I sit on a stool leaning up against a wall and write. In the winter, I get a lot done this way. In the early spring, when the visitation begins to pick up, I will get the stool out only to have someone come in when I get off when I get off work. I will go to a cafe for coffee and to go over what I have written, often on very small pieces of paper with a pencil. It will be something I will read next week. Tonight I will be reading, which I wrote last week about a man who stands <laughs> by the entrance of a stairwell and tells people over and over again that they will be going up a one-way stairwell. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Galt. It looks like we got at least one person joining us uh, on the later side, but it's good to have her. She is, I think she's wrapped up her canvassing for another season. So welcome Patricia Carrigan. But uh, before we do, we, we get to her, uh, let's go to, let's go to next, uh, Mr. John Wizzick. Thank you, Chad. Um, here's another of my bad book report series. Bad book reports, Anna Karenina. Trapped in a loveless marriage to Alexei Karenin, Anna Karenina falls in love with the dashing Count Vronsky. Little does she know that the brogue she finds so endearing is in fact a Brooklyn accent from the year 2185, for Count Vronsky is really Special Agent Louis Bianchi from the Time Anomaly Correction Institute, pronounced tacky. Bianchi suspects that Anna's husband is none other than SS Hauptsturmfuhrer Gödel, who traveled to the past in order to create intertemporal mischief. In the final days of World War II, Gödel had his brain frozen in liquid nitrogen. Centuries later, ardent Nazis reanimated him, and he escaped through a wormhole before Tacky could capture him. But what was Gödel doing in 19th century St. Petersburg? When Gödel is away, Bianchi makes love to Anna. While she slumbers in post-coital bliss, Bianchi searches Gödel's desk and finds the address of Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lenin. Gödel means to assassinate Lenin, thus preventing the rise of the Soviet Union and assuring a Nazi victory in World War II. Much as it turns his stomach to save the commie bastard, Bianchi has no choice but to foil Gödel's plan and keep the timeline intact. Convinced that Gödel suspects him, Bianchi suggests that he and Anna travel to Italy as a diversion. Only Special Agent Bianchi from 2187 takes his place. This is a dangerous gambit because crossing time streams could result in an explosion like the Tunguska event. While 2187 Bianchi pleasures Anna in Naples, 2185 Bianchi watches over young Lennon and defeats, defeats numerous assassins using backflips, somersaults, and kicks to the face. 
He then goes after Girdle, who flees to a train station just as Anna and 2187 Bianchi arrive on the 1045 from Naples. 2185 Bianchi can only watch helplessly as Girdle attacks his older self because approaching would leave St. Petersburg in ruins. 2187 Bianchi dies in the violence. 2185 closes in, but Girdle throws Anna in front of an oncoming train as a distraction. This poses a dilemma for Bianchi. Should he capture his arch enemy or save the woman who shared his bed? Bianchi chooses to capture Girdle. He never liked Anna that much anyway. Bad book reports, Anna Karenina. I'll still give that an A plus, sir. Beats my paper on Hester Prynne and the Scarlet Letter. Oh, I got to do that one next. A book I still have not finished. I'm, I'm proud to say I still have not finished this day. Wow. There I you somehow go. faked it in, uh, in in college lit. It was, oh, you it know, was, the one I hated was Great Expectations. I had to read Great Expectations, and it just was so dull. I just couldn't get through it. I, you know, I read the summary. It sounds like there's like a lot happening in it, but just, uh, you know, I, I was high school, like a sophomore. I just couldn't get, couldn't get through it at all. Well, of course you expect something great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's why they yeah. call it great expectations. It's a, come on. It's marketing. Yeah, so, so it should have been called dashed expectations. <laughs> Even in hot shots part do they have that joke. What are you reading? Great expectations. You like it? Wasn't everything I hoped for. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, oh God. Let's see. The Raminator 5000 wants to wedge in uh, one of our new entries. Patricia, welcome. Thank you for all your political work. Yeah, the candidate lost, but that's okay. And yeah. yesterday I had a, a shithole day at, uh, at the Board of Elections in my neighborhood. Wow. We, a regular person was away our regular coordinator we had this creep come in and he's like and of course there were glitches with the system with the void you couldn't even make a damn void and i could and they took me off the scanner and they had me doing the table and here i haven't done the table over two years even though i read it and they left me without a partner and i couldn't even take my lunch when i should have taken it and then but there's a problem with the voids, all because I wasn't allowed to take a, a lunch time. And you know what? And there was a problem with Scanner C, which I was supposed to be on. They should have kept it closed because the damn thing couldn't spit out the last thread there. We had to wait until for it was only one person at the election, one one candidate, you know, one candidate uh for the for congressional eleven district that was only on the ballot. And we should have been out, should have been finished at nine o'clock. And we didn't leave till 1130 because the son of a bitch wouldn't let us leave because of, because of the scanner. Sorry. He could have filled in the crap itself. And our, our regular coordinator who was away in Italy, she would have let us go. And he was telling us what to do and everything. It was a freaking Nazi. Uh oh. It was a bad experience, really bad. My worst experience being at the uh, working for the Board of Elections. Well, thanks for doing it regardless. Thank you. At least my candidate, Max Rose, won the uh, Democratic primary. <laughs> Got to beat, uh, uh, what's that, Nicole Matakis, who's an evil bastard, conservative from Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Mm. A, lot of okay. evil, a, lot of, a lot of evil bastards this week. Uh, Laura Loomer, who's so insane. She is basically like a like devout anti-Muslim, proud of it. She was even, I think, funding expeditions to like block refugees from being rescued in, uh, at sea. She was a nut and she she barely lost, I think, by like 5%. I, I guess it, was, it wasn't that much, but like for the fact that like 45% tried to vote for her is, is kind of insane. It's not good yeah but she tried I live in an area where i'm afraid hopefully max will win because yeah. we're gonna we're gonna be up to creep with, with uh, nicole i'm sure i have something on a on a brighter note i have baseball cat coup okay 
out at third. Oh, wait a minute, I don't have it here. Oh shit, so sorry, hold on. You can move on to somebody else, I'm so sorry. Oh, I found it. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, let's play ball. Cat in left field interrupts game. Butt wash. Cat in left field interrupts game. Butt wash. Cat strikes out. Umpire regrets decision. Cat strikes out. Umpire regrets decision. And the last one, cat bites pitcher, runs home, wins game. Cat bites pitcher, runs home, wins game. Da, 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 Let's play ball. I think that last one had way too many syllables, but I'll allow it. Um, <laughs> let us just walk. add on this play ball. Let's, um, I'm teasing, but we have, um, we have next for our musical interlude, Mr. Ethan Mackler. All right, I wanted to try something different this time. Um, I wanted to dig deep into the C.C. Ashardra archives on uh, this little piece of technology and do a piece in which I shall accompany the Stone Soup founder, Mr. Jack Powers. I hope the uh, I hope the levels are set. I I, uh, I tested. I did a not very accurate test earlier today. Um, hopefully, I'm just I don't know doing my best. But it's pretty short, so if it doesn't work, it should be over pretty soon. <laughs> All right, here we go. The uh, piece is entitled Pathos. This is the center of what's down here. Can you hear that? It's called Pathos, which is a plant, a very high plant. I have a lot of my house. My rice, there is tea, as this confining plant below the house. My leaves press against chill glass, overlooking an empty courtyard. The sun will grace me between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. this day. the levels for that not bad all not right. bad for the first try all right could you hear both uh voice yes, and I, yes. uh i could i could yeah i think i, 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 think, I think maybe the the, the bass was a little bit louder than the the voice oh really okay yeah, but it, was, it, was, it was understandable so it was good yes you got one more no, that was it. No. Oh, okay. Just ask it. Just ask it. Um, let's go now to uh, Mr. Loy, Mr. James Van Loy, to close us out on this fine, hot as fuck day. <laughs> okay. So, uh, This is, uh, this is one of my, uh, the metaphysics of it poems. So this is the metaphysics of it, all one thing. How can you describe it? It never stands still. It is always changing, but is ever the same. You can't see it. You can't hear it. You can't taste it, you can't feel it. It sneaks up on you. It is always there. It is waiting, waiting. Then we find out who it is. 
It is the dude. It is the dude s. It's buried at the base of Stonehenge. It is the pyramids pointing at Orion. It is the seven sisters clustered round. It is the way we live and die. It is the Virginian dynasties and it is the cult of civilization parasitic that kills the host of life itself. It is clinging to the earth for about 3.5 billion years. It is alone in the vastness of space wondering about how many universes in a multiverse equal one that is us. It is living and alive and when we find the way to stay within the limits of the planet we're on, it is the ancient peoples and the archaic humans of which our double helical cells are still largely made. Okay. And here's a uh, this is a Pinkster Tog song. And Pinkster Tog, of course, is uh, is uh, for um, the Pentecost. Up a moy pinkster tog, all she even con. Leap it with my doctor on at Hanji and the parakeet coiring in the sun. King and model leaf, she's plucking Angela's for an Angelos. Can't you talk your work or not? Your Hanji's fool and pop bubbles. Father was moy hell. Father was the boss. Father was a doodle lick a mingling but owns a leave a hair in Santa Claus. Then you bang for Hanji, Hanji bite neat papa say that he need bite. Up a moy a pinster tug. Met the Kleine maid. All the kinder grow turbort. Rosie in the glop. Zoo you taking all the grow to young ones will and sake and hunt and thousand laws are up. Have you that new manier you bell manier for sea sauce eater in up a moy a pinkster tie. Lots of lean. Morgan can see swang or sign. It can look not and dog. Can fun for hunger in the front of hunger sign of him and up and dog. Father can can smack and, and can freck and tuck he purposely. Papa says, pass off mine kin. That hun she fight, she lost her knee. Father is a hypocrite. Father is a no. Father is an ankle and a lame before the sentence and the rest is fork a wall. It would it no gang care met mine doctor on head on jail open con up a moya pinkster tug summon in the sun. <laughs> Up a moy a pinkster tug, salmon in the sun, salmon in the sun. Thank you. Up a moy pinkster tug. Thank you, James. And I will, I think that concludes the night for Stone Soup. I want to thank everyone who was able to make it tonight. Wow. And we're hopefully, hopefully we'll meet next week. Shouldn't be any problems. My phone problems should hopefully solve themselves next week. And anyone who's complained of a weak internet connection on my side, um, it's happened once or twice. I'm hoping to get that fixed by Friday too. One benefit of Margaret being home is that she can call all the companies and they just like come and uh, luckily we have guests here who can uh, let them in and just hopefully fix our, fix our systems to get us ready for the new for get, I, what I call the new year. I, for me, the new year starts in September with school and fall. <laughs> a much more agreeable 
uh, temperature and time for me. Well, if you're the government, it could be October 1st, you know, the fiscal True. year. I do work for the government, but I, but I also, I'm, I, I'm a, I have relationships with a teacher and I have like, so I'm, my, my calendar is all messed up, but generally around fall is, uh, is, my, is my own personal start time. I hope she feels better, you know. I, she's doing she's doing much better. Thank you, Patricia. Yeah, this, um, this is the way I forgot, you know, because I haven't been on Zoom for a while. Uh, not a problem. It's uh, and hopefully, hopefully in the weeks to come, we'll figure out what's going on with the live shows and everything else. So, uh, can't make a promise except I'm gonna keep the show going. I'm kind of doing it week to week now as far as the online shows because. I don't know if there's going to be a, Friday, a Wednesday that comes along where she's going to need my help, or if I'm going to have to take time off to do um, to do uh, to help her with PT. Luckily, we have a support system coming back up to uh, help drive her places, and we'll see where that goes from there. So, best of luck to all you for getting through the next uh, couple of weeks, especially anyone who work who uh, who used to rely on the Orange Line before things went to shit. Um, Totally free promo. Um, totally a surprise promo. Check out my poem tomorrow in the New Verse News, which actually deals with day one of the whole shutdown of uh, the Orange Line MBTA. And I'm one of the lucky ones because I basically go from bus to bus from for you know from where I am to Forest Hills. So I can tell everyone else. I can tell just from the uh, buses coming and going now that there is a ton of ton more unlucky more unlucky bastards than me. I mean, technically, I can leave early and walk all the way to work and be set and be okay if I wanted to. Uh, rest of everyone else, not so lucky. So, best of luck if you're in Boston getting around. Best of luck if uh, you're just getting around in general. And, good, and I'm gonna hopefully do more calls for submissions. I might, in lieu of uh, Ibbotson Street, likely not putting out an issue on punching Nazis like I suggested they do. I might actually be doing a punching not punching Nazis episode of a uh, week of oddball magazine. So get your, uh, get your, get your punching Nazi poems ready. I'm sure you have at least one, <laughs> at least the makings of one, even a haiku, who knows, but um, it, you know, you could even, even write about the first instance where punching Nazis got someone in trouble. Joe Simon and Jack Kirby created the captain America comic, which actually showed, Captain America punching Hitler, which was before America had gone into war. And this in, this uh, led to a lot of Americans basically giving death threats um, because they figured out that Joe Simon and Jack Kirby were both Jewish, despite their pen names. What's past his prologue, people? Good luck. Um, there'll be more calls for submissions. Uh, definitely whatever political pieces you get. Uh, thanks, John, for that piece in Oddball. Thanks to everyone else who have supplied pieces over the last um over the past months we can always use more uh, there's a lot of shit going on and um i definitely want to be one to comment on it and thanks to everyone who's provided other art for us and we will uh do our best to uh keep the hits coming so again we're going to do the wave i know john's going to wave as best he can and all of you take care of yourselves tonight and take care of somebody else. Have the best of nights and uh, we'll talk to you soon. The show's over. See you next time. Hey guys, thanks all. Bye everybody. Bye guys. Good to see you guys again. Bye bye.